Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing schizophrenia and the antipsychotic drugs. Okay, so I apologize for the abrupt ending to the previous video. We were in the process of discussing the thalamic nuclei. Okay, specifically we have uh, taken a cross section of the thalamus so that we can see where the ventropostral medial uh, thalamic nucleus is. So we've just labelled up the ventropostral lateral uh, thalamic nucleus, the VPL nucleus, and this little one that wouldn't be visible on this picture that I've drawn here, okay, from above, but is only visible when we take a cross section like so. This, which I'm now highlighting up in vivid purple, this is the ventropostral medial thalamic nucleus. Okay, right, so that's just a uh, a bit of background knowledge, the thalamic nuclei, and it means that now when we discuss the mediodorsal thalamic nucleus, it's nicely in the context of all the thalamic nuclei. Okay, right. And by the way, the ventroposterior medial nucleus is usually just abbreviated down to the VPM nucleus. Okay, right. So, we started this discussion of the nuclei of the thalami uh, because of the mediodorsal nucleus and what happens to it in schizophrenia. So in schizophrenia, what you find is that the mediodorsal thalamic nucleus deteriorates. It too gets smaller in people with schizophrenia, okay? And the reason that it gets smaller really is that the neurons which have their cell bodies in the mediodorsal thalamic nuclei uh, are dying. Okay, so the neurons are dying, okay, and that means that this nucleus gets smaller. Now, what does this have to do with the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex? Well, basically, a lot of the neurons that have their cell body in the mediodorsal thalamic nuclei, uh, and of course there's two of them, there's one on each side, okay, uh, a lot of these neurons send their axons up to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, okay? And those neurons then have their axon terminals synapsing onto pyramidal neurons in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Now, if you take away these neurons, okay, that means that the number of synaptic contacts contacts that the pyramidal neurons in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex are going to have is going to decrease, okay? And that is why gradually the pyramidal cell reduces its number of dendrites because they're not being used anymore because they no longer have axon terminals connecting to them, okay? So gradually what will happen is as these neurons coming from the mediodorsal thalamic nuclei deteriorate, that means that the number of dendrites that the pyramidal neuron is going to have is going to decrease. Okay, and that's responsible for this uh, decrease in the size of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that is seen in schizophrenia. Or at least, sorry, I said that with a little bit too much assurance, okay? Um, at least it's believed to be a very hopeful lead as to why the volume of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex has decreased. It's a very nice theory, okay? Um, we don't know that that is the reason that the dendrites uh, have decreased increased in the pre dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but it would be certainly a consistent explanation there. Okay, right. And now, the loss of dendrites and the loss of synaptic contacts from the mediodorsal uh, thalamic nucleus to uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex would then result in the reduction in the function of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and that would explain why uh, working memory and executive control are lost in uh, schizophrenia. Okay, right, so we've now described two little separate things that are uh, occurring in schizophrenia. We've described that in the hallucinations, the auditory hallucinations, you get activation of both Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Okay, we've also described that potentially the reason underlying the cognitive deficits in schizophrenia uh, is that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is involved in working memory and executive control, is deteriorating. Okay, uh, and 
it's not that the pyramidal neurons are dying, it's that the number of synaptic contacts they have is re being reduced, and therefore that they are uh, reducing the number of dendrites they have, and that makes up a considerable volume of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Okay, and then we've discussed that maybe the reason for this reduction in the number of dendrites is that there's a deterioration, and we know that there is a deterioration in the mediodorsal thalamic nuclei, and those uh, neurons in that nucleus are known to send their axons up to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So that would explain um, why there are fewer synaptic contacts going into the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and that would explain uh, how uh, the number of dendrites of those pyramidal neurons goes down. Okay, right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to turn our attention to the dopamine hypothesis, and it is going to try to link everything together, basically, into one consistent theory. Okay, now, I want to make sure that you understand that this is a hypothesis. Okay, it's a very, very nice theory uh, for the pathogenesis of schizophrenia. However, it is almost certainly oversimplified, if not wrong. Okay, but it is a fantastic hypothesis, and it's the best one we have. So, with that spirit in mind, let us now explore the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia. Okay, right. So the first thing I need to explain to you is the dopamine system uh, within the brain, okay? Uh, because we can't explore the dopamine hypothesis without understanding what function dopamine usually has in the brain. Okay, right. So firstly, let me start off by showing you the structure of the neurotransmitter dopamine, and then we'll describe the actual system that we have within the brain, and we'll describe two very important pathways initially, the mesolimbic pathway and the mesocortical pathway. Okay, right. So firstly, let's describe the structure of dopamine. So dopamine is what's known as a monoamine. Okay, it has a single amino group in, is what that means. Mono means single, amine means amino group. Okay, so let's draw this. So here's the amino group here. Okay, then we have two methylene groups, like so. So here's one methylene group, and then here's a second methylene group, like so. Okay, and then uh, you have a benzene ring after that. And this benzene ring is going to have two alcohol groups coming off it. Okay, so here's the benzene ring with alternating double and single bonds. And we're going to have an alcohol group coming off here, and an alcohol group coming off here. And that molecule, that is the structure of the molecule called dopamine. Okay, so we've got a single amino group over here. That's the origin of it being called a monoamine. Okay, here. And... Um, We've also got this benzene ring with two alcohol groups coming off it. Now that has its own name, okay? So this is quite important. This ring, where you have a benzene ring with two alcohol groups coming off it, and this is known as a catechol ring, okay? And it is for this reason that dopamine is described as a catecholamine, okay? So you might often hear dopamine described as a catecholamine. And that's the origin of that name, because it's got a catechol ring in it, and it's also got the amine group, so it makes sense. Right, okay, so dopamine is used as a neurotransmitter within the brain, so it's used to signal between one neuron and another through a chemical messenger. However, it's not really used in the classical sense that neurotransmitters are used, and let me explain what I mean by that. So, the classical sense in which neurotransmitters are used is in this classical synapse way, okay? So what you have is you have some presynaptic neuron here, okay? So this is our presynaptic neuron, okay? Uh, this is the axon terminal, and then it will be synapsing with the postsynaptic neuron, and usually the structure that it synapses with is what's known as a dendritic spine, okay? So this is the post synaptic neuron, okay? And this is most likely a dendritic spine on a dendrite. So if we go back to our picture of a pyramidal neuron, I'm describing a synapse like this, basically. Now, on the dendrites, what you have is, if I draw the dendrite here, you'll have little processes sticking off the dendrite, okay, known as dendritic spines. And generally, presynaptic 
uh, nerves, okay, the axon terminals of neurons, will sign up onto dendritic spines on the dendrites. So generally, dendrites are covered in these dendritic spines, okay, and uh, neurons will have their axon terminals synapsing onto dendritic spines. So that is what I have drawn here. This is a dendritic spine, basically. Okay, and the classical idea of a synapse is that when an action potential arrives in the axon terminal of this presynaptic neuron here, what that will trigger is it will trigger the presynaptic axon terminal to release neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft. Okay, so here is the neurotransmitter coming in. And either this neurotransmitter will be an excitatory neurotransmitter, and the main example of an excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain is glutamate, or it will be an inhibitory neurotransmitter, and the main example of an inhibitory neurotransmitter is GABA. Okay, so I'll just highlight those in. So GABA will have in blue, it's the main inhibitory one, and glutamate in red. Okay, right, and now what will happen is the neurotransmitter, whether it's excitatory or inhibitory, will work on receptors on the surface of the postsynaptic neuron, okay, and these receptors will be ligand-gated ion channels. Now, if we're talking about the excitatory neurotransmitter, glutamate, when glutamate binds to its receptor, the receptor will open, and it will be an ion channel for positively charged, generally sodium ions. Okay, and sodium ions will move from the extracellular fluid into the cell, and therefore you're moving positive charge into the cell in response to the excitatory neurotransmitter. If, on the other hand, the neurotransmitter is GABA, the inhibitory neurotransmitter, then when the GABA binds to its receptor, the receptor will open, and it instead will be an ion channel for negatively charged chloride anions, and you will allow negatively charged chloride anions into the cell. Okay, now, each neuron will be getting um, a huge number of inputs. So if we go back to our pyramidal neuron, it will have inputs all over the place. So it will be getting sodium ions coming in through the excitatory synapses and chloride anions coming in through the inhibitory synapses. And then, right down here, at the beginning of the axon here, so this is the axon of our pyramidal cell. Okay, right down here, at the beginning of the axon of the neuron, which is has got a special name, it's known as the axon hillock, okay? Right down there, all of this information, all of these little sodium currents and chloride currents that are coming into the cell, they will all be interpreted, and the neuron will decide whether it's receiving overall more stimulation or whether it's deciding deci uh, whether it's receiving more inhibition. And if it receives enough stimulation, okay, i.e. if the uh, amount of excitatory stimulation it's getting is more than the amount of inhibitory stimulation it's getting, then the axon hillock may well fire an action potential down the axon. Okay, so that's the sort of classical idea of neurotransmission, that you've got one neuron joining, uh, well, um, ending on the surface of another postsynaptic structure, okay? And that the neurotransmitter is then uh, opening ion channels, which are either going to allow in uh, excitatory sodium ions or inhibitory chloride anions. Dopamine does not work in this way, okay? The receptors for dopamine are not ligand-gated ion channels, okay? So they're not ion channels which are going to open and allow in either sodium or chloride anions. Instead, they are G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, and I was going to tell you about the receptors later on, but I might as well tell you about the receptors for dopamine now. So the first difference between dopamine and these glutamate and GABA is that the receptors for dopamine are all G-protein coupled receptors, so they're all seven transmembrane receptors. So here is a little structure of a G-protein coupled receptor here. So they're single polypeptides, and the polypeptide spans the membrane seven times. Okay, that's the characteristic feature of all G-PCRs, or G-protein coupled receptors. Okay, now, there are five different types of receptor for dopamine known within humans. Okay, and these are given the rather sensible names D1, D2, D3, D4, D5. Okay, for dopamine 1, dopamine 2, dopamine 3, dopamine 4, dopamine 5. And they're grouped into two separate groups. Okay, so D2, D3, and D4 
okay, are called the D2-like group. Okay, so this is the D2-like receptors, or the D2-type receptors. Okay, so that's a group. And then the remaining two, D1 and D5, okay, they are grouped together as the uh, D1-like receptors, or the D1-type receptors. So this is the D1-like receptors. Okay, right. And um, they will couple to heterotrimeric G proteins. And the D1-like receptors will couple to G... Uh, S heterotrimeric G proteins, whereas the D2-like receptors couple to GI heterotrimeric G proteins. Okay, right. So the first thing to say is that these don't stand a chance of being anywhere like this classical neurotransmitter set up here. Okay, they are not going to change the movement of ions across the membrane in this extremely fast way and cause any change in the likelihood that the postsynaptic neuron is going to fire an action potential. In addition, you don't really have synapses quite like this in the case of dopamine neurons. What actually happens is you have the axon terminal of the dopaminergic neuron, okay, like so, just sort of sitting on its own, okay, and when an action potential will arrive in the axon terminal, what will happen is the axon terminal will release dopamine, okay, and it will just release it into the extracellular fluid, okay, and then the dopamine will go off and act on a huge number of different neurons. All the neurons in the local vicinity will feel the dopamine, basically, through their receptors, okay? So they'll have dopamine receptors of these five different types here on the surface, okay? Not necessarily all five different types, but uh, they will probably have at least one of these types of dopamine receptors on the surface, and they will respond to the dopamine. But the response is very different from this sort of response, okay? So this sort of neurotransmission is very different, okay? The dopamine is being released into the extracellular fluid, and it's having an effect on all the neurons locally, and it's causing some sort of metabolic pathway uh, within the cells rather than an ionic change within the cells. Okay, so basically, let me make, take this story even further. So basically, there are very few neurons in the brain that use dopamine, okay? Very few neurons that release dopamine. Most neurons work in this classical sense with glutamate or GABA, okay? So instead, what happens is you've got, in the case of dopamine, you have special areas, okay, which can produce dopamine, special areas which contain neurons which are capable of producing dopamine, okay, and the two main areas in the brain uh, which contain neurons capable of producing dopamine are the substantia nigra, okay, and also the ventral tegmental area. And I want to show you where these areas are because they're within the midbrain, okay? And these two areas are going to be extremely important, particularly the ventral tegmental area. The substantia nigra is going to be important later when we come on to discuss the side effects of antipsychotic drugs. Okay, right. So remember where the midbrain is. So if I draw my brain stem out again, so remember, we have the medulla here, okay, then the spinal cord below here, okay, then we have the pons, okay, and then on top of the pons, you then have the midbrain here, okay. Now, once again, we'll take a cross section through the midbrain, midbrain looking at the top, okay, and uh, this is the Mickey Mouse like structure, so I'll draw this here. Okay, and now we're going to see some additional structures besides the ones that we saw earlier. So here are the superior colliculi here. Okay, and now here is the cerebral peduncle here. Okay, and again it's ended up completely lopsided, but never mind. Okay, so, um, colouring in the portions that we identified previously, we've got the two superior colliculi. Okay, the left superior colliculus and the right superior colliculus. Okay, we've then got the periaqueductal grey matter here surrounding the cerebral aqueduct, which remember is in connection with the third ventricle that's sitting above. Okay, then we've got the red nuclei, and I regret now colouring the periaqueductal grey in red because it now means that I'm not going to be able to colour the red nuclei in red. Okay, so we'll have those in turquoise. 
Okay, now let's put some additional structures on. Let's put the Substantia nigra on firstly. Now the Substantia nigra sits here, okay, just beyond the red nuclei, okay, uh, before you get to the cerebral peduncles. So the very last bit here is the cerebral peduncles and contains a huge number of axons of neurons that are moving uh, down generally. Most of them are moving down from the brain uh, down into the brainstem basically to go into the spinal cord. So for instance all of the uh, axons of the pyramidal neurons of the primary motor cortex run through in a massive great tract known as the corticospinal tract in the cerebral peduncle as it's known here. Okay, right. Uh, however, that's not uh, what we're after. This is the substantia nigra here. And the reason it's called the substantia nigra is that uh, substantia nigra in Latin means black, that's what nigra means, substance, and that's what substantia means. And when you actually see this, it really is really dark compared to the surrounding tissue. Okay, so it's very easy to tell where the substantia nigra is, because this tissue stains, well, not just stains, it, it, you don't even have to put a stain on, it is really, really dark compared to the rest of the surrounding brain tissue. Okay, so that's the substantia nigra here. Okay, and then the ventral tegmental area, you only have one ventral tegmental area. You obviously have two substantia nigra, a left substantia nigra and a right substantia nigra. You only have one ventral tegmental area because it sits right in the midline here. Okay, so that's the ventral tegmental area there. Okay, and the ventral tegmental area is usually abbreviated to the VTA. Now these are the two main sites of dopaminergic neurons within the brain, okay? Uh, so in most places in the brain you do not have neurons which are producing dopamine. However, the neurons in this, these portions of the brain are producing dopamine. And basically the idea is that these portions of the brain, they send their axons all over the rest of the brain, okay? and they send dopamine to all the other portions of the brain, okay, in this sort of regulatory way. So the idea is that these little areas, specific, particularly the ventral tegmental area, we're going to throw the substantia nigras aside for now. Okay, we will come back to them, but their function is a little bit more uh, specialized than the ventral tegmental area. The ventral tegmental area is going to throw axons all over the brain okay, all over the place, and I'm going to show you this in a moment, okay, and these axons that you are throwing all over to different portions of the brain are going to be releasing dopamine into the extracellular fluid all over the brain, okay, and then the dopamine is going to affect neurons in those areas all over the brain. So, what is the point of the dopamine? Well, basically, it has a broad regulatory function on the entire brain is the idea, okay, so it's uh, regular, how am I spelling this, regulatory, that's wrong, the regula it's got a regulatory function basically, and um, it's uh, basically involved in controlling the function of the entire brain, okay, now there are other monoamine systems similar to dopamine, so also serotonin and noradrenaline have very similar setups just like this, you have specific areas in the brain which release, well, which produce and release serotonin and noradrenaline, and they send axons all over the brain and release serotonin and noradrenaline into the extracellular fluid, and this changes the function of the entire brain, okay? So, for instance, these monoamine systems, one of the key things they regulate is arousal, okay? And we'll talk about how dopamine seems to particularly have a function in deciding whether things are important or not, okay? Uh, so, they regulate things on the level of the entire brain rather than on the level of individual neurons being activated or not, basically, by controlling the amount of dopamine or serotonin or noradrenaline that is within the extracellular fluid of the brain all over the place, basically. Okay, so I hope that I've got across to you the regulatory function of the dopamine system, that we have these neurons, particularly in the ventral tegmental area, that are sending axons all over the brain, releasing dopamine into the extracellular fluid, 
and that this can have a regulatory function on the entire brain. Okay, so not just on single neurons, it's an entire brain system, basically. Okay, now what I want to go through is uh, the ventral tegmental area. I want to talk about how it sends its axons all over the brain. And there are two particular pathways that I want to talk about. Okay, and these are known as the mesolimbic pathway. Okay, and also the mesocortical pathway. Okay, so we can work out what these names mean. Okay, meso here means midbrain. Okay, so this refers to the midbrain. Okay, so we've got the midbrain here. Okay, the limbic and the cortical. The limbic refers to the fact that we are going from the midbrain to a limbic system structure. And the specific limbic system structure that we're going to go to in this pathway is going to be the nucleus accumbens, which we'll talk about more in a moment. Okay, uh, mesocortical, hopefully you can work that one out for yourself. We're going from the midbrain to the cortex, okay? So, we want to look at these pathways. We want to see how we're going to go from the ventral tegmental area to the cortex and to the nucleus accumbens. Okay, so we're going to start off with uh, the mesocortical pathway, because for that one, we don't have to discuss the nucleus accumbens. So we'll leave the nucleus accumbens aside for a moment. We'll come back to the nucleus accumbens. We'll start off with the mesocortical pathway. Okay, because we've got enough to discuss just discussing that one before we go on to the mesolimbic pathway. Okay, right. So, uh, to cover the mesocortical pathway, we need to discuss the medial forebrain bundle. Okay, that's the first thing we need to do. And to discuss the medial forebrain bundle, we need a little bit more anatomy. Okay, so... I'm now going to draw out the picture of the brainstem yet again, and we're going to extend it even more, and this time we're going to go forward, basically. Okay, so, let me do this. So, once again, we'll have the medulla here, okay, in fact, I think I'll make that the pond so that I've got more space. Okay, we'll have this as the medulla then, below here, and then we'll have the spinal cord. Okay, so let's colour things in so that it keeps it nice and simple. So here's the spinal cord in green down here. Okay, here's the medulla in orange here. And I'll just straighten this up as well. Uh, here is the pons in red here. Okay, and then above the pons we know we have the midbrain. Okay, and we're viewing it from the left-hand side, so all we can see is something along the lines of this. Okay, then we'll have the midbrain in blue here. Okay, and then above the midbrain, we then have the thalamus sitting here. And we're only seeing the left thalamus now. Okay, and we'll have the thalamus in turquoise. Now, a new structure that I'm going to add on then is the hypothalamus, okay? And why am I going to talk about the hypothalamus? Well, it's because this structure that I want to discuss, which is the medial forebrain bundle, which we really need to discuss because it's the bundle of axons which the dopaminergic neurons are going to send their axons into, okay? The medial forebrain bundle, or the MFB for short. Okay, this bundle of axons is going to run through the hypothalamus. Okay, so we need to therefore have a good understanding of the anatomy of the hypothalamus. Okay, so if you look at the hypothalamus from one side, and we're looking from the left hand side, you'll see something along the lines of this. So it sort of sits in front of the thalamus and then also in front of the midbrain. Okay, so here this structure is the optic chiasm. Then you've got the pituitary stalk with the pituitary gland here, okay? And then, coming back, you've then got the mammillary bodies, and there are two of those. There's a left one and a right one. We're seeing the left one here, okay? Like so, and then it attaches onto the midbrain behind. Okay, so this then, and what colour should I do it in? I'll have to do it in pink. Okay, this then is the hypothalamus. At least this portion in pink is. Then you've got the pituitary stalk there, and the mammillary bodies is part of the uh, hypothalamus. But this structure right at the front, this is the optic chiasm here in yellow, where the optic nerves cross over. Okay, so this is optic chiasm. Okay, you've then also got the pituitary gland sitting here. Okay, 
um, and what colour should I colour in the pituitary gland? I'll do the pituitary gland in, in green. Okay, so here is the pituitary gland in, in green there. Okay, we're not going to talk about the pituitary gland, it's just there to uh, keep the anatomy uh, complete. Okay, and then here, this is the hypothalamus sitting in front of the thalamus there. Okay, right. So that's what it looks like from the side. Now, um, it's going to be more useful for our purposes to look at this from above, because looking at it from the side is quite misleading, okay? Uh, you would think from this picture that I've drawn here that the hypothalamus is just one big solid lump, when in fact it's actually hollow. It's got a great big cavity inside of it, which we know the name of. It's called the third ventricle. So let's now look from above and extend that picture that we've talked about before, which is the picture of the thalami sitting on top of the midbrain, okay? And now we're going to add on the hypothalamus sitting in front of them. Okay, so... Let's start by putting the midbrain here, and I'll try once again to get a symmetric midbrain, okay? So here are the superior colliculi, okay, and I need to sharply go up like that, okay. Hmm, maybe that's the best I've done so far. Right, okay, and then we're going to have the thalami sitting on either side now. Okay, so there's one thalami, the left thalamus. Okay, and here is the right thalamus. Okay, right, so let's colour those in. So we'll have the two thalami here in turquoise. Okay, that's the left thalamus. And here is the right thalamus. Okay, now, in front of the thalami then, what you're going to now have is the hypothalamus, and basically the hypothalamus is hollow. Okay, so it's got this great cavity in the middle of it. So here is the side that we were looking at. On this picture, we were seeing it from this side, basically. Now we're looking from above. And we find out that actually, that was just a wall that we were seeing. Inside, it's actually hollow. Now, you you would only ever say that you have one hypothalamus, okay? So you wouldn't say you have two hypothalami. You would say you have one hypothalamus, but you do have a left side of the hypothalamus here, and then a right side of the hypothalamus here, okay? Um, so this is called the left hypothalamus, but it's not viewed as a separate entity to the right hypothalamus. You do say that you have one hypothalamus, even though people do use the terminology left hypothalamus to mean the left side of the hypothalamus, and right hypothalamus to mean the right side of the hypothalamus. And this front bit is also hypothalamus here. Also, it's important to mention that it actually makes up the floor of this chamber as well. So the hypothalamus makes up the floor as well, so I'll put that here. So this isn't an empty sort of gap here. There is a floor there, which is the bottom of the hypothalamus. Okay, so this is all hypothalamus here. This is the outer boundary, and this is the boundary facing into the third ventricle here. Okay, so we also have a boundary right at the back here. Uh, between the two thalami, which will have the pineal gland here, just to uh, add a bit of extra information in there, not relevant at all to what we're discussing, but there is the pineal gland, okay, M making up the back of the third ventricle here, okay, and now we see that the third ventricle is this big chamber uh, in between the two thalami, and then uh, in within this cavity of the hypothalamus in front there as well. Now, what were we discussing? Ah, yes, the medial forebrain bundle. So, we'll put the ventral tegmental area back on, okay? So I'll show the ventral tegmental area in blue here. Basically, what happens is neurons from the ventral tegmental area send their axons into a large bundle that moves down the middle of the hypothalamus here, and there's another one on the other side as well. So there are these two bundles of axons moving through the left and the right hypothalami, okay, or the left and the right sides of the hypothalamus, okay, and these bundles here, it's not just one fibre, it's loads of fibres running in the hypothalamus here, okay, these are the medial forebrain bundles, so this one here, this is specifically the right medial forebrain bundle here, okay, and this one here is the left medial forebrain bundle here. Okay, right. Now, where are they going to go from here? Well, they're going to 
go up to the cortex and also they're going to leave to go to the nucleus accumbens. Now we're currently talking about those ones that are going to send their axons to the cortex because we're talking about this mesocortical pathway from the ventral tegmental area in the midbrain or meso, okay, up to the cortex. Okay, right. So, we can't really show it going to the cortex in this picture here, so we're going to have to go back to drawing a picture like this. Okay, now what I'm going to want you to imagine is that we have now taken a sagittal section of the brain. Okay, so we're going to draw different pictures slightly to this. It's going to look very similar to this, but the um, motivation for it is different. So basically what I want you to imagine is that we have sliced the brain down completely in half in a sagittal plane. Okay, so I hope you know what sagittal means. If you don't, then um, I'll just explain it. So basically, in anatomy, a sagittal plane means that you put the front of your knife at the front of the head, okay? So if we have your head here, okay? This is the front of your head where your eyes are, okay? You put the front of the knife at the front of your head, the back of your knife at the back of your head, and you chop down like that. That's what a sagittal plane means. Now, I'm going to chop the brain exactly in half. I'm going to chop down exactly in the midline, and then going to pull the brain apart and have a look at the inside of the brain. Okay, that's what I'm now going to draw you a picture of. Okay, right. So, um, we'll draw the right side. So I'm going to draw this side here. Okay, so here is the right hemisphere here, like so. Okay, then we'll have the right temporal lobe here. Okay. Then we'll have the brainstem coming up here, so this is the pons here, okay, like so. Then we'll have the medulla below, like so, okay, and then it will go into the spinal cord further down here, okay, and then in this sort of a position here, you'll have the cerebellum. Okay, right. Uh, now, we want to extend the picture upwards, so we've sliced completely through the brainstem. We've got half of the pons here. Okay, we've got the uh, right-hand half of the pons, the right-hand half of the medulla. We've also got the midbrain above this, so here is the right-hand half of the midbrain. Okay, we're then going to have the right thalamus here. Okay, and we're going to have the right half of the hypothalamus as well here. Okay. So let's put this on as well. So here's the right half of the hypothalamus. Here's the optic chiasm. Here's the right half of the pituitary stalk, the right half of the um, uh, uh, pituitary gland. I was about to say pineal gland, pituitary gland. And then there's the right mammillary body there as well. Okay, so now what we know is we've got the ventral tegmental area somewhere here in the midbrain. Okay, it has sent fibres into the uh, medial forebrain bundle, and we are now seeing the right medial forebrain bundle here. And what happens is they then leave the hypothalamus at the front, and then they go round the entire hemispheres like so. Okay, and of course not every single axon will be doing this. Loads of them will be coming off continuously. This represents the entire bundle. Okay, loads of them will be coming off and going to places prior to this. Okay, and they're going to be delivering dopamine all over the place. You've got loads of these dopaminergic axons coming in this great bundle, all from the ventral tegmental area. They'll all be coming off at different stages, and they'll be going around the entire um, cerebral hemisphere and delivering dopamine up to the cortex, basically. So it would be more accurate for me to put that they're all going up to the cortex here. Okay, right. Uh, so that then, this is the mesocortical pathway. This pathway from the ventral tegmental area down here to the cortex. And of course, I've drawn it for one side. I've drawn it for the right side here. Okay, but it will be happening in the left side as well. Okay, and this is how you're delivering dopamine up to the cerebral cortex. Okay, right. Whoops, this has got a little spit slanted, but never mind. Um, now we're going to turn our attention away from the mesocortical pathway and back to the mesolimbic 
pathway. Okay, so the mesolimbic pathway is, remember, the pathway by which you deliver dopamine from the ventral tegmental area to this new structure, which I haven't told you about yet, called the nucleus accumbens. Okay, and the nucleus accumbens is important all over the place. It's incredibly important in emotion and the reward system, and also potentially in deciding what things are important and what things are not important. Okay, and that's why it's going to be very interesting to us, okay, in the aberrant salience hypothesis. Okay, right. Um, so, we firstly need to show where it is, okay? Now, to show where it is, we need to um, use this picture here, and I'm just wondering, is there going to be space to do it on here? I'll do it here. I'll show it for the right-hand side here. So, basically, there are more structures that we need to show, more deep nuclei sat within the uh, cerebral hemispheres, okay, that we haven't yet talked about, okay, and the ones that I'm now going to talk about, I can't really show on this picture, because they will be sitting in front of the thalamus here, they'd be at the same level of the thalamus, but they'd be further forward, okay, so we remember viewing from the left-hand side, we're seeing the left at thalamus here, we're seeing the left side of the hypothalamus, we now have a structure sitting lateral to the thalamus, and it will be further forward, okay, and that structure is what we're going to discuss now. Now, it's bilateral, you'd have one on both sides, I'm only going to show it for the right-hand side here, because I really can't draw it here, okay? Now, this structure is what's called the lenticular nucleus, okay? So, I'm drawing this. So, by the way, sorry, I know we're aiming for the nucleus accumbens, but to explain where the nucleus accumbens is, I firstly need to tell you other anatomy as well, more neuroanatomy. Okay, so, this is not the nucleus accumbens, but this is something that I need to tell you about in order to put the nucleus accumbens in its proper place. Okay, so this structure is what's known as the lenticular nucleus, and this will be important later when we come to discuss the extra pyramidal side effects of um, antipsychotic drugs. Okay, so this structure is known as the lenticular nucleus, and it consists of two parts. Okay, the inner portion that's closer to the thalamus, okay, is known as the globus pallidus, and I'm not going to be able to fit this in here, I don't think. Globus, or maybe pallidus, okay, there we go. So I'll colour in globus pallidus in orange here. Okay, there we have it. Okay, and then at external to the globus pallidus, here in green, okay, we then have uh, a portion known as the putamen. Okay, so this portion over here, this is called the putamen. Okay, right. And together, those two portions, the putamen and the globus pallidus, together they make up the lenticular nucleus. So the full thing is called the lenticular nucleus. Okay, right. Now I need to show another structure, okay, because what we're trying to build is we're trying to build the striatum, which uh, contains the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is part of the striatum, okay? The putamen is part of the striatum, but another major part of the striatum is the chordate nucleus. Now, the chordate nucleus is quite difficult to show when you're looking from above. Really, we need to go back to looking from the side, basically. Okay, so how am I going to do this? Um, we're going to look from the side, but be aware that we're looking from the opposite side to the side we were looking at previously. Previously, we were looking from the left-hand side, and now, confusingly, we're going to go over to using the right-hand side. Okay, so... Now, it's more natural for me to have this as the front and this is the back, okay? So, we're looking from the right-hand side. This is the thalamus here, the right thalamus. This is the front of the right thalamus now. So, the hypothalamus will be here, okay? And then uh, the midbrain will be, you know, here, okay? Um, so, I'll just add a bit of the hypothalamus on to keep us in perspective, okay? So, here's the pituitary stalk, here's the pituitary then the optic chiasm. Okay, so hopefully that has got you oriented. So we're looking from the right-hand side now rather than the left-hand side. Okay, now, sitting in front of the um, thalamus then now, we have the lenticular nucleus, and we can't see the globus pallidus because that's behind this portion that we can see, which is the putamen sitting out here. Okay, now, 
I'm going to now add another portion that is sitting here, basically. Okay, and this is going to curve round in this rather fantastic way. Okay, and this is known as the chordate nucleus, then. Okay, so let me colour in the chordate nucleus. And this is in the same plane, the same sagittal plane as the putamen. So it's, it's here, basically, and I'll try and put it in, in there in a moment. Okay, so this is the chordate nucleus here in vivid purple, okay, being outlined as we speak. Okay, right, so let me now colour it in as well to make it even more unmissable. Okay, so all of that purple structure there, that is the chordate nucleus, often just called the chordate, okay, but more correctly, the chordate nucleus. Okay, right. Now, again, we're going to come across the chordate later when we talk about e the extra pyramidal side effects of antipsychotic drugs. Okay, now, the nucleus accumbens sits here. It's the final portion of the striatum, at least the final non-trivial portion of the striatum, and it fills in this little gap that's sort of left here. Okay, so this here is the nucleus accumbens, so you can see how it sits nicely close to the hypothalamus, and in fact what's going to happen is uh, fibres are just going to leave the medial forebrain bundle and go into the nucleus accumbens here. So this here, this is the nucleus accumbens, or the accumbens nucleus, some people call it. Okay, right. So you have this entire structure sitting lateral to the thalamus, and you have this on both sides, and it will be symmetrical, okay? So this will also all be on the left-hand side. So basically, if I try now and put this in, in this picture, okay, I won't try and draw the chordate nucleus, actually, okay, but the chordate nucleus will be here, basically, okay? And then the nucleus accumbens will be down here, basically. So, um, shall I try and put it in? I'll try and colour it in in orange. So it will be in this sort of position here. Okay, and what's going to happen is some of these dopamine fibres are going to leave the medial forebrain bundle and go into the nucleus accumbens, and this will be the case on both sides. So we'll have our left nucleus accumbens here, which will be next to the lenticular nucleus on the left-hand side. Maybe I can sort of start to put it in here. Okay, there's the lenticular nucleus on this left-hand side as well. Okay, there's the globus pallidus. Oh, no, I've got it the wrong way around. Damn, the globus pallidus in orange. Okay. And then here is the um, putamen in green here. Okay, and the chordate isn't shown, but it would be, you know, starting where the nucleus accumbens is and then rolling all the way around and then having this tail down here. Okay, right. So, again, you'd have fibres leaving the left medial forebrain bundle and going into the left nucleus accumbens. Okay, right. So that now is the uh, mesolimbic pathway discussed. Okay, right. So, the last thing to say before we actually go into the full-blown dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia is that different receptors for dopamine are used um, in different parts of the brain. Okay, now this is a complete oversimplification, but it's a helpful oversimplification. Okay, so we're going to use it. Okay, and it to some extent is true. Okay, so in the nucleus accumbens, you're going to have D2 receptors, so that specific type of dopamine receptor, D2. Okay, whereas in the cortex, okay, generally you're going to have D1 receptors. Okay, so the dopamine that's being released into the cortex by the mesocortical pathway is going to be acting on D2, sorry, D1 receptors on the neurons of the cerebral cortex. Okay, whereas the dopamine that's being released into the nucleus accumbens, okay, is going to be acting on D2 receptors and is therefore going to have its effect through the D2 receptors. Okay, right. So, I think we'll call it there for this video. We now have the mesolimbic pathway and the mesocortical pathway all set up, and what we'll do in the next video is we will discuss the full-blown dopamine hypothesis for schizophrenia. Okay, that won't actually take us that long now that we've got all of this prior knowledge, and then what we'll 
be in a fit position to do is discuss how the antipsychotic drugs work. And then what we will move on to is discussing the nigrostriatal dopamine system, which is what do the dopamine neurons in the substantia nigras do, okay? And how uh, that is going to form the major side effect of antipsychotic drugs.